Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining and welcome. My name is Marina Pied, and I will be one of your hosts for today. The topic that we will be covering is take control of your medical device cybersecurity and asset management strategy. Before we get started with the content, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. Just a few things to keep in mind throughout the session. Um, everyone is muted upon entry. Um, if you wish to submit any questions, please send those to me. Um, at any point, we, I will write those down, and then at the end of our content, we will go ahead and address those by our experts. Uh, also, um, at the end when we are doing Q&A, I will go ahead and unmute everyone, so I ask if you have any strong background noise, just make sure you mute yourself again. Otherwise, we can just do it manually. And in the next slide, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. For today, we have Mike Witt, our Healthcare Director from Burwood Group, Soil Paniker, Global Director for Technical Channel Enablement from Medigate, Brian McGowan, our Security Practice Director from Burwood Group, and uh, last but not least, Mark Cervantes, our Global Director of Partner Channel from Medigate. Uh, gentlemen, I will let um, you guys take it away. Let's go ahead and uh, jump to the next slide. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks, Mariana. Appreciate it. Uh, Mark, I think you and I maybe can can uh, talk about these first couple of slides, and hopefully I just want to let everybody know our goal here today is to really have a conversation around medical device cybersecurity, asset management, how you can really get your hands around that. So we're going to be having a, a, a conversation. I hope that you'll join in, join in on the Q&A, uh, either present a question that we can ask or we can answer or, or jump in on the conversation. But, uh, you know, really quick, today we're going to talk about, we want to talk a little bit about the threats, right? What's the threat landscape for medical device security today? Uh, then our friends at Medigate are going to talk about the platform and how they can specifically address those concerns through the technology uh, platform. As we come back around then, we want to we want to really talk about how we wrap our whole vulnerability management and utilization management programs around the information we can get on medical devices and then uh, give you some ideas for what you can take home today. Uh, Mike's got some of those great uh, leave behind, if you will, uh, items that you can take away from today that I think will give you some things to do and then some room for some Q&A. So uh, with that, maybe we'll jump right in on threat landscape. Um, you know, a couple things I wanted to, to just throw out there, right? Um, we've got some great statistics here, and we'll talk about them in a second, but looking at the Panaman research about medical device, I think the big thing that jumps out at me is that almost 75% of healthcare organizations today know that medical device security is one of their most significant risks, but fewer than a third or so actually have a program to target that risk or have a strategy and a vulnerability management program that really helps them identify those assets and protect them. So that's the big delta we're trying to solve for, right? We have no organizations need this. We know that, that you're aware that that's a risk, um, but trying to plan and, and strategically develop that program is tough. And when I was thinking about why that happens, um, I was really trying to relay it to how typical vulnerability management, you know, for those of us that have been in IT operations or on the vulnerability management side, We've had a long time to build our vulnerability management programs for, for workstations, for servers, for devices that speak protocols that we understand, uh, HTTPS and FTP and things that are our typical internet protocols, right? So if we kind of break down the steps and we see where the challenges are, I think it's gonna help us to, to see some of the risk today. So, you know, at the beginning, we have just knowing what we have in our, in our inventories. Uh, this has always been a challenge for, for everybody, but over the years, we've added systems on our networks that can automatically scan for devices, that can use Active Directory logins to find devices, that can pull from OUs and containers to tell us where the devices are. Um, and we've gotten pretty good at identifying those devices. On the med device side, we don't have that same system of record in many cases. Um, typically, it's fragmented. We have some information from the network side coming from our network operations or our, our IT operations teams. Typically, we have a biomed team maintaining an inventory separately, uh, to, and usually using that inventory for, for maintenance updates. So it's maybe not real time and maybe not um, as, as completely filled with the information we'd like about those devices. So right off the bat, we have this disconnect on what's really out there in our environments. How are they functioning? What versions of software are on them? Um, so right away, we're, we're starting from a, a decreased position of visibility. Um, we also can't automatically scan those devices in a lot of cases because they're life safety devices. Uh, we don't want to put them at risk of 
of a of a disruption of service. So we have to collect that information sometimes manually, sneaker sneaker uh, sneaker net, if you will. So that puts us at a disadvantage, right? Now, once we've got those devices that we know we're going to target, comes the question of the, the where's the patching and updates going to come from? Um, again, on on a on a typical vulnerability management program, looking at servers, workstations, we've got a multitude of places, right? We've got the, the manufacturer of the software, we've got the manufacturer of the OS, we've got the community of people who are doing testing against these applications and finding vulnerabilities. We've got CVE databases that can tell us what the vulnerabilities look like and what the risk is. On the medical device side, again, we're much more blind, right? We don't have that information. The typical patch and update cycle we're seeing is manufacturer driven and it's more around compliance or system updates that uh, support functionality. There are very few times where we get published vulnerability updates from our manufacturers about their med devices that say, hey, this is a security risk, we need to update it. Um, so we're relying on a single source, usually the manufacturer, to get that data. And if we're not getting anything proactively, we're just doing our maintenance plan on a scheduled basis. Again, we can't vulnerability scan those devices, so we're not getting the kind of data we would get from a workstation or server uh, because we don't want to scan it, right? We don't want to put that device in jeopardy of being, of being uh, interrupted in its service. And um, we don't have all that data, again, about the, the versions in the workstation or the versions of the software. So we then pivot, right? The next step we, when we think about vulnerability management for workstations or servers is we put in controls. We put in next generation firewalls. We put in application aware IDS, IPS systems. We put in network access control systems that allow us to identify traffic either moving from the device to the device out of the network into the network. Um, again, we have devices that can understand protocols like HTTP and HTTPS, FTP. Um, those next generation firewalls have a tough time digesting protocols like DICOM, like HL7. So a lot of times that traffic goes by unmonitored. Similarly in our IPS and IDS, it's difficult to tune those rules to really get the, the, the traffic inspection that you want. And at the NAC level, we have to have a good device profiling, which again comes back to not knowing exactly what's on that device, right? How do we know exactly what it's running? How do we fill in all those device attributes, like what the operating system is on, what version of code is it running? Um, how do I profile that device to know if it's a med device or not? What part of the network it should be segmented on? All of these things lead to that ability for us to have less visibility of those devices when we're trying to plan our vulnerability management cycle. Um, less chance for us to identify risk, less chance for us to, to proactively attack those devices. So, Mark, I, I think that you can probably relate to that, that conversation. That's really the struggle for organizations today that we work with. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, you know, you, you, you touched on it multiple times, and really what it boils down to is it's, it's an information, um, you know, issue. You, you can't protect what you don't know is there. Right. So first and foremost, you have to discover every single device that's on the network. Uh, above and beyond that, you need um, some of the more granular information uh, about these devices to be able to understand where vulnerabilities exist. Right. And, uh, you know, since Medigate came to the marketplace, uh, the first thing that we really heard over and over and over again was, look, just give me visibility. I just need to know what's on my network. I'll talk to you about how we can protect it. Once you show me everything that exists on my network, I don't even have a handle on that. And to your point, that's a scary way to, to be looking at a, at, a, at a network and trying to, to manage it or build a security posture around it. So I think each and every one of the points that you hit is exactly uh, the reason that Medigate came to the marketplace and is uh, doing what it's doing today. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I completely agree. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the kind of current state situation, about why we find ourselves even in a more pre precarious position, maybe for device management and security today? Sure, I would be happy to. So, you know, again, if you, and you know, I've been using this analogy recently, and it's really just because it's stuck. And, um, you know, if, if you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and the boat comes to a screeching halt and, and you realize that you're stuck, the first thing you're going to do is, is take inventory of what exists on the boat, how much water do I have? How much food do I have? Where's my flashlight? Where's first aid? The hospitals feel that they're in that same position right now. You know, they've never been tasked or stretched from a resource perspective uh, like they have, you know, with COVID-19. 
Um, and the first thing that everybody's looking to do is, again, that evaluation of exactly what exists. Now, not to say this wasn't already the current state of affairs, right, to understand what existed so that they could build security practices around it, but now it's truly a scramble to understand what exists. What do we have? What can we provide service with? And for that matter, what is the utilization of those devices? Right. And, uh, you know, in this COVID-19, uh, you know, world that we're living in right now, uh, you know, some of the things that, that we have seen rise to the top that we've all heard about it. It's even been on television regarding, you know, uh, ventilators. Right. And, and there's a number of other devices that are critically important right now. Being able to track those devices and know exactly where they are and exactly how many you have and exactly how many are online and functioning. And furthermore, understand the utilization of those devices at this juncture has never been more important. And we're hearing that from the marketplace. Uh, you know, Medigate's trying to be sensitive. I think everybody is to, to not task hospitals with something that's not uh, important at this moment because we understand they're just trying to address, you know, the impact of COVID-19. But another analogy I recently heard that I really love is we also don't want to be, uh, you know, running past a a burning building with a bucket of water. Uh, you know, Medigate has that bucket of water because we're able to, again, plug into the network and emphatically bring you the information of where your devices are, what, what devices you have on the network, and, you know, be able to give you granularity around even the utilization of those devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think recently we've seen a number of, of uh, pieces floating in the news, especially about uh, long-term persistent threats and how there are there are very good indicators that that organizations have been compromised but that the threat actors have been sort of biding their time waiting for the right time and right yeah. now when hospitals are running at 110 percent utilization and everyone's focused so heavily on patients patient services delivery this is that soft target time that unfortunately is a is a prime striking time for an organization who's maybe already got a foothold and has been just waiting to x exploit it, right? Yeah, there's really two ways for a hospital to be impacted, right? And, and first is data loss, right? No hospital wants to experience that. Nobody wants their, their information out there in the wild. Uh, and that is, a, you know, it's a massive impact to a hospital. But the other way is, you know, ransomware. Um, so imagine right now in, in the current COVID-19, you know, scenario, uh, if a hospital is utilizing its CT scanners at the highest level, right, to be able to, to do chest x-rays and things like that, if, uh, if ransomware was placed on those devices, it cripples the hospital, right? And the bad actors know that. So, um, you know, unfortunately, this is, is real world. A lot of people don't think about this, but, uh, you know, this is, this is happening. And there has been, you're, you, I think you were referencing that, that article that came out in Wired, which really spoke to this. Um, it was some research that was done by Microsoft, and yeah, the bad actors are going, hey, now's the time. Let's go. Let's go in places where we know they're going to pay up, and they're going to pay up instantly because they cannot afford to be down for one instant. So that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, and we find ourselves in this very kind of uh, – uh, it's not serendipitous, right? It's like unserendipitous place where we've got the, the – the conflagrants. I'm going to have to go take a vocabulary lesson, but <laughs> uh, we, we're at the spot. We've got we've got a high risk, high utilization time. We've got a number of operating systems that are part of a lot of the embedded uh, infrastructure for medical devices that went end of life. You know, Windows 7 being the big one. A lot of devices that ran on that operating system that can't be immediately patched or updated because of FDA regulations. So you've got targets that are vulnerable. You've got a high utilization uh, time frame. You've got a high risk to the hospital for downtime. All these things add up to being the perfect storm for a for a, a ransomware just interruption event. So, like you said, it's even more important that you know where it is, what it is, what what its state is, and ideally that you're starting to build zero trust around those devices so that you can ensure that they're not going to be impacted if something happens. Uh, to the overall and infrastructure of the of the facility. Yeah, and Medigate has been very proactive in this. Um, you know, we we saw this unfold, you know, before our very eyes, and 
So we've worked very closely with our existing customer base as well as uh, organizations that we're, you know, in, in evaluations and POCs with and, and been able to highlight. And I think Salil will touch on this a little bit later, but, uh, you know, the Medigate platform has been a saving grace in many instances. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, Sounds great. Sure. So, you know, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit about Medigate and, and, you know, even the things that we were just talking about lend themselves to it. I mean, first and foremost, you know, it's in the name, Medigate. Our founders had the presence of mind to to sit down and really look at this problem and say, okay, look, you know, this is a complex enough issue. Um, it, it's worldwide and it is of the utmost importance to be resolved. So we're going to go after this problem, but we're going to go after it with laser focus. Right. And so we were founded in 2017 and we were really incubated in the clinical setting, which is huge because being able to understand uh, the clinical speak, the clinical environment, uh, workflows of, of, of what a hospital functions like on a daily basis, uh, all of those types of things is key to understanding the pain points um, that, that the industry is, is suffering. Um, and so, as I said, we came to the marketplace with one thing and one thing in mind only, and that is to to solve this medical device issue and really the overall IoT, IOMT, as we like to call it, the medical device issue. And our, our focus has never changed. Uh, because of that, we've, you know, we've enjoyed some great success uh, over the last couple of two and a half years. Uh, we've grown. And the fact, I think this slide might be just a bit outdated. We're closer to 100 people now. Uh, and we are growing every day, and uh, it's 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 you know largely attributed to you know the the phenomenal technology that our engineers have put together, uh, the strong sales team and, and engineers that we have throughout the U.S. and around the world, uh, and lastly and probably the biggest one is the need for something like this in the marketplace. I mean that is we were we were almost vacuumed in. When we came to the marketplace at Hibs in 2018, I mean, the reception was was unbelievable because this was needed, right? Uh, since then, we've we've probably installed, I think, where that number of 150 is a little closer to 200 at this juncture. Um, installations around the world, and that's everything from, you know, uh, existing customers to boxes that we've delivered just over the last week and are going into proof of concepts uh, with, with new hospitals. Uh, and networks, um, you know, two plus, two million plus devices that we've discovered and the parsing protocols. And again, I will still Salil's thunder, but this is really our secret sauce here. It's it's the proprietary protocols uh, for these very complex and unique devices uh, that Medigate has spent the heavy R&D lift, time, energy, and money to do. And this is really why we focused in one area and one area only because it's incredibly difficult to say we can do this and we can do this right in healthcare. Oh, but we can also do this and we can do this right in manufacturing. Oh, we can also, you know, when you go into all verticals, it's really difficult to be really good at one, right? Um, some of the differentiators I've already spoken to, it's a dedicated healthcare solution. We, we don't go into any other verticals. We spend our 24 seven in healthcare. Um, the other one, and again, Salil is going to get into this, but uh, is is our comprehensive and, and accurate discovery process of DPI. We didn't invent DPI. We just brought it to the problem and focused on it and utilized this methodology. And very quickly here, I'll just say that, you know, DPI is, is really, you know, deep packet inspection is the only methodology from which you're going to be able to extrapolate the data that you really need to create clinical context that you can then enforce policy around. Uh, unlike AI or machine learning, where, you know, the, the reality of it is you're going to have false positives. Uh, you know, there's instances, in fact, where they can't see behind a gateway. Well, guess what sits behind gateways in hospitals around the world? Ventilators. So we're talking about COVID-19, right? Um, above and beyond that, you know, an infusion pump um, can have a module on it. It's not going to see that module. It's going to only see the first infusion pump's data in terms of uh, IP and, and MAC address and so forth. So, you know, when you have thousands of those, this is problematic. That means you're not seeing the entire scope of your devices. And again, you can't protect what you not what you don't know is there. And, you know, it, it's only one device that the bad actor needs to be able to penetrate into the, into the healthcare environment. Um, you know, we have a massive group of incredibly intelligent cybersecurity research experts uh, that are working 24 seven, uh, you know, really, combing through the insights and the analytics to be able to give us the capability that we bring to the table to our healthcare, um, you know, clients. Um, you know, all of our clinically-based security policies have literally been 
an evolution that uh, yeah, it's been really impressive for me to watch and see what our engineers have the capability to do. Um, you know, and we are just uh, we're just expanding in so many ways because of our focus in healthcare, and and that shows. You know, there's a, a list of some of our you know accolades on the right hand side there, but really the accolades are the customers that we have uh, that are happy to speak on our behalf. And, and, and you know, without naming names here, we we have some of the most important healthcare systems in the world. Um, you know, that rely on Medigate as well as some of the largest healthcare networks in the world. Um, and, it, you know, it's an honor to be able to bring this technology and provide them uh, the security they need and uh, to expand our footprint um, in doing so with an organization like Burwood. Uh, Burwood is also, you know, I mean, we have integrations that, you know, Salil will touch on, uh, you know, at multiple levels with some of the largest and most important uh, security organizations in the world. But above and beyond that, our relationships with organizations such as Burwood, um, who is a very sophisticated uh, and knowledgeable organization that, that is working with healthcare systems around the nation, uh, this speaks volumes because, you know, Burwood's not the kind of organization that's going to bring in any technology. They vetted us at the highest level, and we were happy to go through that process with them because we came out of the other side, and they understood exactly what we could do, and then it was roll our sleeves up and let's go to work, and, and we've done that, and it's been a, a very fruitful and great relationship to date, and we look forward to expanding it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Brian. Um, so what, what, it, what I think we'll do is I'm um, going to actually get into the Medigate platform and provide an overview. Perfect. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. I should have said it. Now I'll hand it over to Salil. But uh, Salil is our technical director of global enablement and uh, really works with every single one of the organizations that we partner with to bring the Medigate platform to the world and works with our integration partners and has been on the sales side of the organization and has really sat and, and understood the pain points of, of healthcare systems and, and even small little hospitals uh, throughout the nation at the highest level. So his understanding of not only the clinical setting and the pain points, but what our technology can do is really second to none. So, um, you know, I hand it over to you, Salil. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, Brian, Mark, I think you did a great job of framing the conversation, and uh, what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes or so is kind of walk you through the platform and show you how Medicaid ICT can resolve some of these issues that are faced by healthcare organizations, primarily around medical device visibility and how we can actually create a medical device security program to ultimately secure those devices. So, uh, before I actually get into the product dashboard, um, what I'd like to talk about briefly is our DPAC inspection technique on how we do our device profiling, as well as our architecture and our deployment model. So, as Mark and Brian alluded to already, Medigate is a cybersecurity and biomed analytics platform. We are a SaaS solution. Uh, so, we, with that said, we actually have a hardware appliance we would deploy on-premise at a hospital network. And the way we get insight into a, a hospital's medical devices is we actually need to see their network traffic. So we will receive a span from their distribution switch or router, and we are actually looking at mirrored traffic coming from those devices. So with this approach, we actually have um, no impact on medical devices or the actual network. And the traffic we are looking at is based primarily medical device protocol communications that are happening uh, from medical devices to integration engines, EMRs, and PAC systems. And Medigate, the Medigate collector actually has over 85 medical device protocol parses built into it, and we are parsing medical device protocol payloads. And in addition to looking at metadata and header information in the TCP stream to build out the device profiles. So this approach of looking at medical device protocol payloads is unique to us, and we're the only ones doing, like, doing it like this in the market. So to Mark's point earlier, a lot of the solutions in this market primarily are IoT solutions, and they are designed to work as a general solution for IoT and not specific to medical devices. So this presents challenges in terms of not discovering every medical device and also misclassifying them. So we actually did the heavy lift of uh, reverse engineering and building medical device protocol parsers to do full and accurate inventory of medical devices in addition to IoT devices. So uh, basically a hardware collector on premise, and then we would spin up a AWS dashboard, which you see here, and we would actually be able to get multi-site views in a healthcare system and do enterprise-wide visibility of all the connected medical devices and do active monitoring and alert 
on anomalous behavior. So what you're looking at here is a typical instance, a demo version of a customer dashboard uh, where you actually have multiple hospitals reporting in. In this case, it's a 12 site healthcare system. And then once we receive the span, we're gonna start inventorying medical devices and IoT devices. We'll start telling our customer how, much, how many of them are high risk, which I'll get to an example shortly, how many were found in a given week. And I always like to stress this. This is, again, the protocols that were used to do the device profiling. You'll see a lot of them were, were not uh, proprietary. A lot of them are proprietary. They're not based on DICOM and HL7, which are the more documented protocols. You'll see the Hilltop, Philips Data Export, Isorona for anesthesia cards, MedCat for ventilators. So, again, these are all proprietary protocols, which we build parsers for to do that inventory. So when you're doing inventory, you want to be 100% certain of the devices in terms of the clinical attributes and not misclassify them because that's ultimately going to lead to bad policy creation for enforcement. So you'll be 100% sure from an asset inventory and visibility that you have it right. And then if you look at the bottom here, you'll actually see a breakdown of all the different hospital sites reporting into the system. And we actually tell you across the entire healthcare system, the location, the number of devices in terms of medical and IoT, number of high-risk devices, as well as how many were found on um, mixed uh, medical and IoT BLS. So if we actually drill down into the inventory here, I want to walk you through some of the categorizations we perform. So uh, give me one second. So if we go by the category view, we'll actually see all the medical devices and IoT devices. So this is grouped by FDA classification. So patient devices are your infusion pumps, patient monitors, vital sign monitors. And each of these will have the different models we fingerprint in addition to the number of high-risk devices associated with it. Surgical devices is the ventilators, anesthesia monitors, robotic surgical systems. Clinical IoT is IoT devices typically found in a clinical setting that do not have an FDA classification like capsule medical device integrators, sonar connectivity engines, BD PIXs for medical dispensing, telemedicine, especially now with COVID, very uh, pertinent and relevant across every healthcare system, uh, radiology machine, any type of imaging type systems that purport to a PAC system, like C-arms, MRI machines, CT scanners, imaging workstations, clinical lab machines, hermatology analyzers, ESR analyzers, and finally, IoT devices. So all IoT devices, including mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, uh, general IoT, clocks, point of sale, security cameras, um, expected endpoints like laptops, PCs, network scanners, VoIP infrastructure, building facility equipment, network infrastructure, and video conferencing equipment. So with the full breadth of IoT and clinical devices, Medigate is actually able to inventory. So what what are the options if a hospital is actually do, doing triage with COVID? So we actually have built a actual view for COVID uh, specific that ties back to the COVID-19 support infrastructure. So if I want to know which of my COVID-19 support infrastructure in terms of inventory and utilization, I can just apply this filter. And obviously this is customizable to every healthcare organization's needs, but this is actually what we're based on our customer feedback. We've seen that they want visibility into right now, especially during the triage stage, to see where they can send patients. So you'll actually see um, ventilators, of course, and telemedicine systems, as well as ultrasounds and patient monitors, in addition to some, any type of remote devices that they have to deploy for their staff to do, do remote uh, office uh, engagement. So if we actually drill down into an ultrasound here, well, as you see, again, all the ultrasounds found across all the different locations, and we'll have a distribution by different manufacturers, the models. And if I click on the utilization, I'll actually see the overall utilization of the fleet across all my entire healthcare system. So I'll see the number of daily devices used. In this case, I have about 205 ultrasounds. I'm seeing a little over half of them being utilized right now. Um, the average utilization is about a little over five hours. Here are the typical days and times that the devices are being used, the average number of examinations being done, and the examination duration. And we actually even break this up by the weekend and weekday activities. Okay? Now, if I look under the fleet, I can even mouse over every day and see the overall utilization that's happening on a given day. Right? You'll see the number of devices that are currently online, 
offline in use. So this is important when you know you have to um, when you have to tell someone tell which site it has availability for a patient to do triage or or care. Um, also, from an inventory management standpoint, if you know you need to buy additional devices or you're actually good at a specific site in terms of current resources. So this is intelligent data that can be used for future procurement and resource allocation decisions. If I mouse over the images and exams, I'll actually see the number of examinations and images associated with all those devices on a daily basis. And we actually further break this down into the type of exams that are being performed across all the sites. So you'll actually we'll actually tell you the ascension numbers, the procedure codes for observing, the total number of images for that particular ultrasound. And we'll actually tell you, uh, again, the body part category that was used, as well as the body part. So the, the lung, especially with COVID, is very top of mind. You can actually even search against this different type of body parts that you fill in that data. And then finally, we have an anatomical view to show the distribution of all the scans across the fleet uh, with regards to, again, the chest, the head and neck, abdomen, pelvis, and which body part makes up most of that uh, exams. So this is, again, very relevant data for the biomed teams, and this is available for every make and model type device we have in our system. So infusion pumps, ultrasound, C-arms, MRI machines, uh, this is available. The utilization heat map is very valuable uh, because we know what times and days the devices are heavily used. So I'll see that, if I click on here, I'll see that 62% of devices are being used on a Wednesday to 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. And we can even see the times when there's actually very little utilization. So this can be reallocated to a different department or site, or if the preventive maintenance has to be done in terms of upgrading firmware or patching the device for known vulnerabilities, this is something we can take back to the device manufacturer to say, here's the windows you can do an SSL tunnel to upgrade the system without having any patient impact. Okay, so with that, I wanna actually get into an example. Great. So this is actually a Philips ultrasound that I just drilled down into. And again, one of the things Medigate is providing is uh, full visibility and granularity of those medical devices. So this is a current problem right now because right now we're seeing the medical device uh, inventory is very broken in terms of it's manual, it's error prone. You have spreadsheets, you have CMMS platforms that do not have uh, fully populated data about the medical devices, primarily IP and MAC and make and model. But we can actually report on close to 30 plus clinical attributes on a given clinical device. So we can tell you, for example, the, not only the IP and MAC, but actually the uh, type of device it is, the manufacturer, the model, the operating system embedded in that system, the app version, the serial number, the AE title, the protocol that was used, in this case, DICOM, to device profile that device, the actual VLAN it was connected to, and the actual switch that uh, it was found on. So we will actually um, have location awareness data through integration with Cisco Prime and Rupa Airway, which will provide us for connected medical devices or wired medical devices, the actual switch port that the device is connected to. And for wireless devices, we'll tell you the actual building and floor the access point the device is connected to. Yeah. We can even add labels to these devices. We can say, for example, this is a um, suspicious device. We're going to investigate this. We can add custom labels to these devices with a custom asset tag specific to the hospital network, where it could be based on the asset device type, location, who's, who takes ownership, or the VLAN is associated with it, and then query on it later. So post fingerprinting, uh, actually, once we do the device profiling, we will actually can integrate with this with your CMMS platform. So if you have a Novolo, an Accruent, uh, we have a full integration built that we've done with customers and with the help of Irwin, where we would actually automatically build medical device profiles in your CMMS platform with having all this up-to-date inventory. So as we see changes in the network traffic of updated firmware, uh, app versions will automatically update the record in the CMS platform. So you'll have a central system of record for all connected medical devices as we find them in the network. Okay, so that's one of the most that's one of the most popular integrations we offer and that we've done with the Burwood team. And post identification, we're going to start doing active monitoring of devices. So we're going to alert on 
any suspicious communications we observed, any known vulnerabilities found on the device. We also found, for example, an internet connection made outside of a manufacturer update. We also saw talking to Philips to a manufacturer update. And this is to Brian's point on it earlier, this is actually a Windows XP embedded system, so that's unsupported. Any of these insights can actually be queried across the entire device inventory. Here are the number of devices that have an unsupported operating system. So Microsoft is not going to support this from a patch management standpoint. We need to put this on a segment segmented VLAN to only allow critical workflows to occur and not have it exposed to any other devices. So at a network segmentation layer, these are the devices you're going to have to protect because, again, they're not going to be supported at a device stage. So, Leo, that's a, a great uh, a great segue for us to to move on because I know you can just keep on going, and there's so much uh, about this platform that, that we'd love to share with each and every person, uh, you know, on the webinar today. Uh, but we'd love to step into, you know, some of the emerging practices uh, that are coming from from this type of analytic information being available to the healthcare systems. Yes. Uh, so, you know, that might be a good uh, a good segue for us to, to move to that that part of the discussion to make sure we don't run out of time today. Absolutely. And, uh, Mark, if I can just have two more minutes, I will. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, so, to Mark's point, there's so much we can talk about, so I will just want to <laughs> highlight two more two more points here. So, here's actually our network Sankey diagram, which is showing you all the communications we're observing for the devices. So, what we can do with this is actually build a custom DACL to only allow clinical workflows. So we've seen it communicate to Philips for updates as well as a unauthorized external connection. We've seen DICOM communication to the imaging workstation and the PAC system. We will build a custom DACL, right? So because we know the clinical workflows for every medical device. So the, this is how we work with the Burwood Services team to build a medical device security program where if you have a NAC solution like a Cisco ICE, a Force Scout Counteract, or you know, we were clear past, so these DACLs can be pushed out to them to only allow the authorized clinical workflows, like DICOM for protocols, only communicate to Philips for updates, and then as well as some internal network communications, and then restrict everything else. So this is how you would do inventory of the device, look at anomalous behavior, and then build a DACL to push out to a, a NAC solution to only allow clinical communications. Okay, same thing with the uh, checkpoint, we can only allow Philips for updates and restrict everything else. All right, and what I'd like to tap off with is we have our, uh, this is something we came out with called a communication matrix. So this is, allows you to kind of see all the authorized communications uh, based on clinical workflows that is observed, observed in the hospital. So anything in red is basically uh, forbidding communication between medical devices. So we see, for example, an infusion pump comp communicating to a medical dispensing system. We see a vital signs monitor communicating to an EKG. So if I click here, I'll actually see the instances of those devices, right, where I see 46 EKGs talking to 12 vital signs monitor, which is, is not necessary for clinical workflow. And this is how we can quickly map all the authorized and forbidden communications currently observed in the hospital and actually take action to protect that, okay? So if I actually go to one of these devices, oh, wait, sorry about that. Oh. If I actually go to the, one of those devices, I can actually push out the clinical policy to uh, restrict those communications only to those devices. Okay, so this is again a great way to know uh, quickly where you stand in terms of authorized clinical workflows and create a policy to only allow them in the future. So Leo, let's, uh, let's move on, my friend. I, I really appreciate your passion here. As you can see, guys, uh, you know, we've got a team uh, of, of, of experts uh, that, that uh, really love to speak to the technology and, and, and the capabilities to, to your teams. You know, I want to bounce back over to you and really talk about what you're seeing out there and being asked for, you know, around emerging practices and so forth. Yeah, for sure. Um, so first off, thanks, Salil, because you covered a lot of the areas that I think we're hearing about, right? As I break down what we're seeing for practices for med device security that are working for our very uh, advanced or future-looking clients, we really see a couple of big areas, right? The real-time visibility is key. 
moving away from spreadsheets, moving away from inventories that require manual reconciliation, being able to get all of those device attributes in real time and see real network traffic uh, connectivity so that we can tell is a device actually online, is it actually being used, um, what's it being used for, when's it being used. That information is key towards understanding, like Mark said, what do we have so we can secure it. Um, being able to make sure that configuration management systems are critically up to date uh, and and know that our information is consistent. I think, Salil, you touched on the integration with CMMS. Um, similarly, NAC profile information is is uh, is able to be integrated as well. Uh, CVE information from your vulnerability scanning can be layered on top as well or can be pulled in to match those devices so that you don't have to actively scan them, but you can still get detailed on that, on those uh, vulnerability exposure points. So it's really about making sure that we have full visibility of those devices. Then moving to that mapping communication baseline, the matrix you were just showing is critical if we're going to build a zero trust environment. And that's really what we're after for medical device protection is building that zero trust. These devices have very limited communication needs. It's very clear who they're supposed to talk to and who they're not. The network should support that and should, should block that. So there should be no reason that those devices are communicating with anything they shouldn't be. So the matrix that you showed allows us to know, is that device communicating outside of its normal parameters? Is it plugged into a VLAN with other devices that it shouldn't be? Um, and how can we build those security policies, whether they're implemented in your NAC, whether they're implemented in your firewall that's doing east-west traffic inspection, uh, whether they're implemented as, as dynamic ACLs and switching, like we want to make sure that we can really lock down that traffic. And so understanding those baseline communications are key and then being able to automate the policies so that uh, they're quickly and easily deployable. And then of course, you know, the, the, the continuing way that we get better zero trust in uh, envelopment of those environments is through network segmentation and access restriction. So deploying resources to be able to do that east-west inspection in general is important. We still see many facilities that are running a relatively flat layer two, layer three network. They've, their segmentation from collision domain perspective for traffic, but there's really not inspection happening between those segments. Now that we have that clinical baseline data and the communication information, we've got the ACLs that we want to deploy, being able to put that segmentation in place is key. That's one of the things that we're spending a lot of time with our healthcare clients is designing that segmentation. Um, two reasons, right? Number one, it's going to protect those medical devices from being impacted by a malware event that may happen in administrative purpose in administrative areas or, or non-care delivery areas. We want to we want to shut that flow down right away. Second reason, they'll stop those med devices from being a foothold for an attacker, right? When they're looking for a lateral movement point, any embedded device, especially one with an old operating system that hasn't been security updated is going to be a target. So if we can segment those devices off, block the communication, uh, it's less likely that an that a, a attacker is going to be able to use them as a foothold. So um, it all comes back to really being able to build that zero trust. I know what this med device needs to talk to. I know that it doesn't need to talk to anything else. We want to block all communications inbound and outbound. Um, from a network and security perspective, this is really where we're focusing on today, and Medigate brings that intelligence and that full visibility that you have to have in order to be able to build the, the, the key steps to, to protect your network. Um, let me move on to the next one quick. We can talk about how clinical assets are driven. Maybe, Mike, I'll, I'll throw this one over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. And, um, you know, I, I noticed we have a number of biomed and clinical engineering leaders on the call and want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, th these folks are facing a number of challenges and it, there's just a very extensive list of to-do items to ensure the security and availability of medical devices. Um, compliance requirements not met if devices can't be found or not properly maintained and documented. There's incomplete and outdated data uh, about operating systems, application versions, and patches required. And, and we saw in Salil's demo, there, there, there's a lot of screens that we looked at, but really what Medigate does is kind of outline almost a to-do list in order of uh, risk and priority and um, timeliness of needing to 
to be able to uh, mitigate and remediate um, potential issues. So it really forms a practical system of action. Um, and that's compared to what we see out there. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of manual processes that are inefficient. A lot of time is wasted simply looking for devices. You, you need to know what's out there. You need to uh, find a time when the device is not being used to be able to patch or update. Uh, and, and again, the dashboards we've seen re really can identify uh, BioMed with uh, that to-do plan with information on what remediation actions to take first. So as Salil mentioned, a after the hardware connector is installed, you're, you're going to see a deluge of data. It's just a lot of data to take advantage of. And so to build in a, a more data-driven approach to life cycle management, um, now, with, with all, all this information, Biomed knows the inventory at a much more granular level, some idea of where they're located, is what, uh, and, and you know when devices are online, offline. So that inventory information plus the utilization plus the to-do list remediation plan, now Biomed has a much more proactive approach to managing the devices. And this proactive approach is much more efficient and powerful than a calendar-driven approach to PM based on six-month intervals, for example. And Salil and Brian mentioned, but a lot of this management of maintenance activity uh, is eased by automatically exporting the inventory and location data and the medical device profile data into a CMMS system that you're already using for management. And what is a really exciting utilization of the data is now surrounding asset utilization. And that, that's important not just with COVID-19 and the subsequent peaks in um, kind of need for ICU critical care monitoring devices, right? That This is going to be lasting for 12 to 18 months as we catch up on scheduled surgery, surgeries, et cetera. But from a utilization standpoint, you, you know your inventory at a given time. This provides insight into how you allocate the device resources across the hospital. Also, it, what, what we've seen um, is that most hospitals either purchase or lease more devices than infusion pumps, for, for example, than, than what we really need. So knowing utilization can guide those procurement decisions, and, and there really can be a strong ROI associated with um, uh, understanding what you've got before you reach out and, and know what to purchase. So I think going to the next slide, and, and we're, we're being conscious of leaving some time for questions. So, so Brian, I'll, I'll flip it back to you and uh, let, let you cover the next couple slides. Yeah, I think I'll, this one just really quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna gloss over because we've talked about a lot of this. I really think the big thing is what you were just describing, Mike. The, if we can integrate our our IT operations vulnerability management with the with the preventative maintenance schedules that our biomed teams have been using, we can really get those two tasks to fold together into one overall vulnerability management program that includes our med device inventory and that gives us visibility of how those devices are protected. That's really the key, right? So all of these things that you see here really are set up to help us build that next gen, uh, highly functional PM process that informs biomed about what the real risks are to those devices, informs our IT teams about what they might not know about the biomed infrastructure. And we, we didn't talk a lot about that, but typically in most facilities, biomed and IT operations are not well aligned on what the what the business cases are for use of devices. IT sometimes washes their hands of that and says, well, that's biomed. And biomed is worried about it from a functionality perspective and not a, not a supportability and operations perspective. This really helps us bring those two back together. So um, you know, that integrated asset management. And then, um, you know, just really quick, uh, what do we see as a state-of-the-art solution today? Complete visibility, real-time updates, asset management that's strategic instead of reactionary, uh, being able to correlate activities that we're seeing across the entire enterprise, and being able to pull in that metadata so that we really know what's happening and, and that we can make proactive decisions as, as we're threat hunting in our environments and being able to uh, inter interact and integrate solutions, right? Uh, beyond just being able to share those those uh, those metadata 
informational pieces. It's really being able to to pull data into our SEM, into our vulnerability management platform, from our NAC to our NAC, back and forth with the CMMS, um, all those integrations that really bring us the full picture of what's happening. So maybe if we boil it down, here's some takeaways. Uh, Mike, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to take your feedback on them, but you know, I'll tell you, this is, these are the things that Burwood is really helping organizations to build today. Right. Our goal is how do we get that cross-functional participation? Uh, and it's all the members who are stakeholders, whether it's IT security, it's compliance teams, it's IT operations, it's healthcare, uh, healthcare and biomed teams as well. How do we get them all together? And we know that beyond just the technology, there's also the process and procedure, the governance that goes along with it. So we, we're also helping to enable those organizations to make sure that they've got the right run books, the right uh, flow charts for vulnerability management and incident response for when there's problems, making sure that we have the right reporting in place to be able to show the compliance of the devices, um, how we develop all those pieces that really are part of your, uh, that are part of your full med device security program beyond just the technology. Yeah, I think that's actually one good point I want to bring up here is it is incredibly important to have a, a trusted advisor uh, that has the the acumen capability to work with you guys with work with the healthcare system and that is Burwood you know in spades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. If you could, Slew, if you could just jump back really quick, just a couple other things at the bottom too. You know, one of the one of our biggest goals is that overall east-west visibility and traffic um, enablement for organizations. So at Burwood, we have a protect and defend security architecture that really relies on network visibility, endpoint and workload visibility and uh, automation and orchestration around that data that you're getting from those devices. So one of the things that, that, that we help wrap around this particular conversation in med device is that entire threat hunting, uh, threat hunting enablement. So how can, you, how can you design that segmentation, implement that segmentation, get those proper automations in place? And I'll close my kind of feeling with, it's all about zero trust, right? Zero trust for med devices, zero trust for communication flows, zero trust for applications. The more that we can that we can uh, leverage uh, minimal minimal use or minimal need requirements for our communication on the network, the more we can enforce that uh, that level of just in time provisioning, then we can really help cut down on the risk and the factors for for um, exploitation. Mike, was there anything you wanted to touch here before we move off? Well, I'd, I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, there, there's a huge step one to building that zero trust roadmap, and there's even some maybe additional uses of this data surrounding medical device utilization. And for most organizations, we're seeing that that's kind of a phase two or down the road type activity, but we're, we're we're excited about the potential and, and what we've seen in terms of being able to use the utilization data to optimize procurement, be able to allow BioMed clinical engineering to partner more effectively with clinical service lines and other leaders in the organization, because uh, there's just so much data around how the devices are utilized, when they're utilized, and it helps in scheduling resources. Totally agreed. Yep. So maybe let's, let, I know we're running out of time. I want to make sure there's time for questions. Maybe first question uh, to our, our webinar team. Do we have anybody with a question that we could jump to right away? Uh, we have not received via chat, but we did receive some uh, questions that were submitted before the webinar started. So I'll go ahead and read one. Brian, since you finished the last one, I'll uh, concentrate on this one that is around security. It says, uh, it seems like all security roads lead to network segmentation. Uh, would you say that's usually the end game? That's a great question. I, I would definitely say that that's where we're heading with a lot of clients, but uh, network segmentation can only be uh, truly well implemented if we understand those communication flows, right? So, um, like I said, network segmentation to some means we've got the we've we've divided our networks we've maybe created a network for biomedic network for admin users but if we don't understand what the communication is between those 
it's really hard for us to effectively get that zero trust. We need the tuning. We need the uh, history over time to establish those baselines. And so I, while, while I would agree that the end game is segmentation and, and eventually zero trust, which is kind of evolution of segmentation, I, I want to caution everyone that that's a, it's an iterative step towards that and you have to have good visibility. Um, there are no, unfortunately, out of the box rules that you just turn on when you buy your uh, NAC solution or you put uh, east-west firewall in, they don't just have a flip switch and build me segmentation for med devices. You have to have that insight into what's happening on the network. And so, um, yes, definitely want that, but you need the you need the insight. All right, thank you. And then um, I'm paraphrasing this one, also submitted before the webinar started. Um, if you, either Mark or Mike, if you would like to expand a little bit on how COVID-19 is going to affect just the current uh, solution market. Mike, go ahead and well, take that. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I like your knowing what's on the boat analogy in terms of kind of working with what we have. And, and, and we did end up covering this, I, I think, during, during the presentation, but COVID-19, it, it from a care delivery standpoint, it's just a really weird time of dealing with a lot of patients that are really similar. So what we're seeing peaks and use, uses of, you know, of course, ventilators, but also all the monitoring systems and drug delivery devices that are, are needed to treat that type of patient. That type of acuity and it, it is going to keep extending and there's going to be peak uh, waves of demand for, for the foreseeable future where all the surgeries that have been put off are going to come back. And that heat map that Salil showed that shows kind of the peak number of devices that you use, that that's going to be a key metric to look at because you really need to plan for peaks uh, and then you know you're going to be okay with the valleys. You know, I'd like to add one thing and, you know, specific around this COVID uh, scenario, um, you know, Medigate took an, an approach at this when, when all of this rolled out and we really said, okay, how can we put our, our best foot forward as an organization globally? And, uh, you know, our founders and our CEO, Jonathan Langer, had the presence of mind to say, look, guys, we, we have typical cycles like everybody does, and we want to go into a POC, and we want to establish criteria, and we want to, you know, establish budgets and all of that. But we took all of that skin off and said, hey, how can we be a good global citizen right now? And, and mitigate just so the, the audience understands, uh, you know, we can have a conversation um, with the network teams to understand the topology of, of any given network. Uh, and after a one to two hour session like that, we can, we can get a box out to a hospital within a week and, and plug that box in. That takes two to three hours. And within a week's time, we can show you the environment, um, that Salil just showed. Uh, we could give any hospital in the world that capability within, you know, a two weeks time. Uh, and that is really going, hey, we want to, we want to help if we can. We know that we'll talk about business down the road. And so in this COVID environment, I, I would like to, to impress that out there because it is real that we do want to play a role. All right. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Mark. Uh, with that, we will conclude this webinar. Um, just as an FYI, everyone will receive the slides, uh, the recording of this webinar, along with um, any follow-up resources. Um, our team will make sure that you have what you need, and then if you think of any other questions, uh, please let us know. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining, and I hope everyone stays safe.